by the Ecological Design Center and the School of Architecture and Allied Arts. Today we have Brent Bubnam. Um, he's the founder and principal of Hyphy Design Lab, an ecological engineering design research firm in Oakland, California. Brent is training in restoration ecology and environmental policy and is known for his innovative ecological engineering and breeding projects. His work includes institutional, municipal, and commercial and residential scale green infrastructure projects ranging from rainwater and greywater systems to urban parks, creeks, green belts, brownfield rest remediation, green streets, low impact development, and green roofs, including the California Academy of Sciences. Um, Brent also serves as the founding principal of Urban Biofilter Nonprofit, which works on designing and advocating innovative approaches to bioremediation in communities with severe environmental injustice issues. Uh, thank you again for joining us, and here's Brent. Thank you. Thanks a lot for coming, guys. I appreciate it. It's nice to be here. I just uh, finished a design competition with an Oregon-based firm last night, um, Allied Works. I don't know if you guys know those folks. but um, So I was actually down with them in California and coming this way, so it was sort of funny. But um, I will show some of that project later on. Um, but I wanted to sort of just dive into a little bit of philosophy. I have way too many slides, so just interrupt me and shout out and holler whenever you have questions. There's no reason to wait. <laughs> but um, So what I want to do at first a little bit is um, sort of talk about the role of ecologists um, in the design process and just sort of where the design process is going and how we, where we see it needs to go. And this is a question we get all the time. What do you guys do? Uh, and this is sort of when I get asked this question, I, I sort of realize that I'm working with a client that I need to re-educate in the process because we've constantly been trying to sort of erase a lot of the specific disciplines. I didn't go to school for architecture or landscape or architecture or any specific disciplines, so it was never weird for me to work across disciplines, but what we always say is that we're ecologists. And the problem is this, even though the ecologist has gained a lot of respect in the architecture realm um, over time, I studied restoration ecology and wetlands and wastewater treatment. And uh, even though they've gained a lot of respect over time, they still sort of within the sort of lexicon of different disciplines get sort of forced into a specific role. And what we tend to see is sort of this, the ecologist is seen as this precious role in a design project to work on something very specific. Maybe they're coming in to study some specific bird or you're bringing an ecologist in to do you know, plot samples. <laughs> and people think they now understand what the ecologist is and what their role is in a design team. And so I sort of bring up this very um, stereotypical model of sustainability and say that this is sort of a key problem of how people are bringing ecology into the design realm in that you know, they think that if we have these overlapping Venn diagrams, we can have this perfect design concept. And for us, we really see it more as obviously all of these systems, social and economic, fall within sort of ecological principles. And a lot of our work has to focus around sort of re-educating people about um, economics and that economics isn't actually a science. It's a theory and it's more of a religion than it is a science. And so we need to kind of reorient economics and social thinking within ecology and sort of basic laws of thermodynamics <laughs> and not to mention laws of sort of nutrient and carbon and water cycles. And so we sort of start to work with developers and architects in cities and look at a different way ecologists can help solve problems of cities or of sites and start to say, you know, by looking at a systems thinking approach to our problems, whether it's an economic issue, a public health issue, or sort of a land management issue, um, ecology can help you solve a lot of the issues and see the interconnections. So this is what we do. And um, in order to do that, we have to work at a lot of different scales. And we see a lot of benefit working at all the scales. You know, We are innovating constantly on projects and trying to permit really innovative things like on-site wastewater treatment and gray water and rainwater reuse. And you can really use like single family homes to do that a lot because you can permit things a lot easier on a single family home, a lot less liability, people are a lot less risk. But then what we're realizing is to have significant impact, we have to be working on larger municipal neighborhood. And really what we're diving into more and more is sort of industrial scale work. And I'm gonna be working with a few other people tomorrow, I think, on a industrial ecology workshop 
where we'll be focusing on a couple projects our firm's doing, like a rum distillery in Belize, and this major nonprofit we pr ha project we have called Urban Biofilter, which we probably won't even get to today. I have deep at the end, but um, there we're working on sort of industrial and transit-oriented pollution. Um, so we also sort of see a critical importance to work at different times. I mean, still too often we see in the design process that the architect kind of wants to develop a concept and then come in and post-rationalize a lot of ecology onto it. Um, and so we more and more are finding architects and people that want to work with us to sort of dive in at the beginning and work in our minds all the way from sort of community participatory planning. And it's really weird as we work on bigger and bigger projects, they always want to hire sort of a community participation consultant. It's really weird to me. I feel like all the dis disciplines should be trained in that as sort of a core of their work. And for us, it drives a lot of our work and sort of working with the communities where we're based. And then obviously, we need to be involved in the conceptual work. But also what you get is a lot of ecologists or sort of environmental consultants that I say don't have a deliverable in that they're like working on the project and doing check boxes or sort of put together really nice conceptual ideas at the beginning, but they're not producing the construction drawings. And so that's something we really drive home is that we need to follow the ecology through the project. You know, we're writing specifications for a museum right now where we're able to sort of write in specific amounts of earthworms in the soil. And it's in a contract that is then legally binding. So for us, kind of taking it through these really detailed level of drawings and prototyping and construction is critical. Otherwise, a lot of it just gets kind of greenwashed away. Uh, so for us, the other element is something we're driving home constantly is really erasing silos. And the problem is we've got all these disciplines who have risk and liability, like to stay in their sort of silo of, of work. And I'll get into this specific project a little later, but I'm just using some of our diagrams from it show as a concept. Um, we're legally a civil engineering firm. We also do landscape and architecture, urban planning and research, but often we'll get kind of brought in to do one discipline and they want to kind of keep you in this realm. And we say, well, it's, you know, really develop an integrated system. It's hard for us just to look at how water sheets off the building. You know, we really have to do the plumbing engineering, look at how we're going to take it and reuse it in the building, or we're going to have to work very closely with the plumbing engineer. And then obviously we're going to have to look at how that then also gets reused in the landscape. So more and more what we're getting brought in to do is sort of follow water through the whole project or follow something through the whole project to make sure it gets done. Um, and another core driver for us, and this is maybe less ecologically driven and more socially driven, but we really like to work with a lot of different people. You know, Right now we are really inspired working for developers where we're you know, forced to really crunch numbers and make these systems work with a return on investment and sort of show them the externalities and make the financial markets work. But we're also really excited, like right now we're building, these are two projects I'll show you. We're building a public restroom in uh, San Francisco and about three blocks away we're working on the new SF MoMA. So for us, kind of having these juxtapositions is really critical to kind of stay fresh and have good perspective. Not going to get into this project here, kind of more of a plug for tomorrow. <laughs> but um, we'll be talking about two or three different industrial projects. And one thing, the reason I brought this up is because kind of what we found is we end up being sort of a translator. We're working on this project. We got hired as the master planner. And when I went in for the interview, I told them I have no clue what, what happens in a rum distillery. I've never worked on one, but you should still hire us <laughs> to run the design for you because it really comes with how you approach the design. And what we're doing is we're working with a whole slew of distillery engineers from Puerto Rico. And nice thing to note in this drawing is everyone has a calculator out. Um, and what you realize, though, is that they really can't communicate with the farmers. Um, these are all the guys working in Belize uh, on the project. And I have a meeting with them a few hours later. There's no calculators. There's a bunch of mixed drinks. And here, you know, we're actually translating the engineering into how it actually can relate to the field. You know, we're talking to them and finding, you know, we can't grow as many days as Puerto Rico. And, you know, the problem is that we don't have engineers and designers who can really communicate with the users and the people that know the sites. So that's a lot of what we do. And what I was going to do is kind of use these core philosophies that we drive most of our work with to kind of explain some of our work throughout the rest of the presentation. But 
One really core piece is analog ecologies, and I'll show you that in a second, but I'm gonna kind of get into the top three in detail a little more, and then sort of show you throughout all of our work how we sort of integrate research work and you know, true scientific work during a design process, which can be really hard, um, where and how we do community process and sort of how we really work on making these systems we design interpretive and sort of have feedback. And so first one is this concept of analog ecologies. And um, I am confronted with a lot of ecologists and non-ecologists, people who think they're, they know plants sort of that are native extremists. I don't know if you know any of those people, but um, uh, it's really interesting world where it's like almost like fascist, I think, in that we have, and we have a community where they're like, we have to build to this specific ecosystem that was here 100 years ago. And it's kind of problematic when we're especially building like high density urban uh, centers. Um, in some projects, we are actually though trying to look at like how do we sort of recreate existing or remnant or destroyed or endangered ecosystems in roofs. But I think that's more of sort of like a plea to try to save them as like a little museum of an ecology rather than a real attempt that we're gonna restore some precious ecosystem. So in this case, this is Golden Gate Park uh, before it was turned into a Eurasian ecosystem. Um, and so what we did is we worked with Renzo Piano and SWA on sort of a design for the new Academy of Sciences where we referenced a lot of that ecosystem. We went and found specific species that were endangered, um, propagated them, got about 1.5 million propagules and like increase the seed bank of a lot of endangered species on this roof. So that's really cool. And another project I worked on though, you know, we're building a hospital in a grassland and here they wanted to do a drought tolerant roof, no irrigation and all native plants. And I said, you know, we're introducing 7 million gallons of water to this site through the hospital. <laughs> um, and so, sorry, I thought I had another one. So basically, the, we need to look to an ecosystem that can actually help us process the water from the hospital, deal with the cooling tower blowdown, deal with the higher salt loads. So what we did was, this is in Southern California, actually went and looked at sort of these brackish wetland ecosystems and brought those plants because they served the function that we needed in the building. And they kind of responded to the water quality and other constituents in the site. So it's a little bit of the analog ecologies and sort of finding and sort of adapting ecosystems to our changing conditions. Um, another core focus for us is obviously hydrology. It's a major issue in California and beyond. Um, one thing, I'm sure you guys are sick of, of seeing some of our drought maps, <laughs> as I am, because the funny thing is I'm very used to the drought cycles, and I don't kind of go through this like CNN, Fox News freak out every year that we're like all gonna die, um, which happens you know, every four or five years in California. And what people don't realize is that this is a pretty common cycle that's been happening pretty regularly. And it's more that we just have to come to grips with that if we're trying to continue to live there. Um, and so what I kind of constantly bring up, this is a study done of about 80,000 people in the US. And on the far side are sort of maps of which utilities they find most important to them. And water shows up at the top of all of them. But also you survey these people in like kind of commercial or or residential markets, and about 70% of them say that, you know, they take the water for granted. It's not their responsibility to get it. So a lot of our work is sort of refocusing people to actually address their own utilities and sort of provide for their own resilience and showing that both on a residential scale up through a commercial scale, it can have a lot of financial return um, as well as sort of provide a lot more stability and resilience. So this is, um, kind of wanted to show you two projects we're doing under the hydrology stuff. We have many, many more, but um, this was a cool project because it's sort of at a slightly bigger scale that I think really makes sense. Um, this is a project we're doing for an affordable housing complex in San Bernardino. And um, it's, I think, gonna be a really great precedent or condition that we're gonna confront a lot in that it's an old army base, it's an affordable housing complex. They want to essentially double the density of this site um, and what they were confronted with is essentially like sewer upcharge fees, putting in new pipes for about two blocks to get, you know, their stormwater and wastewater to the next largest pipe and 
all of that utility cost for them, not even touching the site, just dealing with off-site utilities was going to be about $15 million, $18 million. And so what we said is give us some time. Let us try to figure out if we can work with this extremely conservative um, county <laughs> and develop a on-site strategies where we don't actually have to increase any of the size of our off-site utilities or anything in the street. So this then was about a year and a half master planning process to get on the same page with county officials down in San Bernardino around water and infrastructure. And this was the final plan and in here we basically, as I'll show you throughout it, we didn't do the design, we just, the engineer. <laughs> but um, the cool thing was we were able to sort of retain a lot of the, the plant material that was on site. There's very few trees in San Bernardino. But what we had to do was zoom way further out from our site. Our site is that little red dot. Um, when we started looking and working with the utilities, they had this huge fear, basically. This, this big colored block is the water table or the aquifer under San Bernardino. And what they had this fear of was they said, we drink our, our groundwater, so we can't infiltrate our stormwater. So I just started cracking up. And I'm like, well, how are you going to keep having drinking water if you're not infiltrating? Um, and they said, well, we don't want to contaminate our drinking water, so we don't want to infiltrate. So we then had to sort of dig through tons of hydrology data. And interesting thing here is the red areas are where the water table is a lot lower than it historically was. And the dark blue areas are where it's a lot higher. And so if you kind of like take a cross section through our site, um, here's a cross section. Red is the historic water table and blue is the new water table. And it's kind of a typical condition across all of these places that we've covered in concrete. Essentially, it only infiltrates right at the river or the creek where that blue line is. It's the only place the water can get into the water table, so obviously it's really high there. <laughs> and everywhere else it's dropped quite low because we've paved it over. So what we were able to say is, well, on our site, you have a real huge risk of subsidence. We're going to talk a little bit more about earthquakes and things tomorrow, but basically you've got all this airspace, and when one of the seven faults that comes through here happens, it's all going to sink. Whereas down here by the creek, it's going to be like jello, and everything's just going to shake and have some of the most high impacts. So for us, this was sort of a way to zoom out and look at a large scale hydrology issue, but then show how we can start to solve that on one project and do that on more and more in the city. So first, what we had to do is sort of convince the housing authority that babies weren't going to die in, in the, these bioswales and places where we would be flooding, um, which actually took a long time. And then we had to look throughout the site and sort of map where we could deal with larger and larger flooding um, depending on sort of flood events. And one crazy thing at first, we, they said, you know, you need to design for 300 year flood events in a row. And we said, you know, this is crazy. You think this is like, there's gonna be an Armageddon um, <laughs> coming. And the crazy thing, the year that we were working on the project, 200 year flood events happened within a month. <clears throat> so I kind of got a lot quieter and have a lot more respect <laughs> for, for nature. But you know, what we had to do is so the resilience of the site to be able to kind of deal with these storm fluxes and infiltrate and manage it and not have any storm sewers. The next thing we had to get into was sort of um, talking to the county and convincing them that they're running out of water. And it was surprising they didn't realize this, but we had to pull out their data and say, you know, by the time we're building this project, 2015, 2020, you already have a shortfall. There's not enough water in the city of San Bernardino for people to drink. So we need to look for alternative sources. And we then showed them, you know, groundwater and recycled water, just the cheapest. It's not even trying to make an ecological argument. They're way cheaper than any of these other means of getting water. And the cool thing that we're starting to find is, you know, like 10 years ago, we were sort of on the crazy fringe of engineering. And now, as people start to understand the real issues and costs, basically we have about a $700 billion shortfall each year in just keeping up our infrastructure. And most of that's in transportation. So just getting water, getting waste to and from places. So what we start to say is if we can deal with it all on site, we eliminate that major cost of infrastructure and sort of like over the last few centuries, we've been sort of going to bigger and bigger centralized systems and now we're convincing the utilities and the regulators to come back. And so start to find like appropriate scales for appropriate projects and not say everything has to be decentralized or everything has to be centralized, but there's a nice mix. 
So when we start doing is sort of taking the soup of all these different water supplies that we have and could need and where we need to use them and start mapping out sort of most appropriate uses of different types of water. So we start to say, okay, well, we don't need the highest, purest water to flush a toilet or to irrigate the landscape. We actually want water with more nutrients and start to map where it all goes. Um, what we did too is that, you know, Cal Green, which is our new sort of green, uh, water and greening standard, has set some supposedly very rigorous standards, um, but we're able to cut that water use in half by just being a little smarter. And I think within California and everywhere else, we need to be setting our standards a lot higher. So we're proposing to use about half the amount of water that's legally available to us. Um, and so we start doing that by basically storing about three, four million gallons of water in addition to about 15 million gallons that can be stored on the surface and use that for flushing about 75, 80% of the toilets. Um, we also are then taking gray water to irrigate 18 million gallons of landscape. So this offsets almost all of our landscape use, and probably all of it. Um, but the really funny thing is we were sort of trying to convince them just to use full black water, and it made a lot more sense, less plumbing, it was cheaper, the plants would like it a lot more, but there's still sort of like a poo taboo. I don't know what it is, but um, <laughs> so we're still haven't gotten over that psychological hump with a lot of um, utilities and operators, and so hopefully that will come. Um, but they were like, well, we can get a, you know, we can understand and use gray water maybe, but we don't want the full black water on our lawns. So that said, kind of have to make some compromises because for us, we don't want to just show great concepts. We want the projects to get built. Um, and so then we have to dig into sort of how they're going to, how we convince them of the water savings and how each new sort of reduction in their water use saves them more money, especially in the South. What we gain is sort of a huge chunk of money that we can then use to fund a steward of this system, someone to take care of the water infrastructure and the landscape. I think that's a cool element that we save money on utilities, can put it into humans. Um, and so there's just an image of that. So what I wanted to show you next, just because there were some cool overlaps, we just presented this project last night. No one else has seen it other than the jury. <laughs> so this is actually at UC Santa Cruz. And um, we're working with Allied Works, Portland-based architecture firm, on a concept. And we're competing against a couple other big name firms. I think we got it. No. <laughs> um, we won't know for a few weeks. But um, this project is really was really fun for multiple reasons, but one interesting thing that I was just working with one of the guys at Allied Works, and he said he helped organize this conference last year, Will Smith, so I don't know if you guys know him, but <laughs> he built a lot of the models for this project. Um, so that was an interesting coincidence, but this project is really inc incredible. It's a ridiculously beautiful site. Um, UC Santa Cruz is actually in an, a nature reserve, so for us it's very compelling. And the city of Santa Cruz and the county has horrific water supply issues. They, you know, they're the first county, the UC and the city just tried to get this environmental impact report approved. First time in the, in, the, in the state that one's been denied for 25 years and they just didn't have enough water for what they were proposing. So it's really like a watershed uh, legal case. And so we sort of integrated that, but also sort of took the program and the focus of the project um, where the project is, is sort of sits at the edge of this meadow and the forest, but also the really interesting thing is it's Institute for Art and Science. So they're sort of trying to create a museum and a think tank to bring artists and scientists together to collaborate. So for us, that's extremely exciting. We're actually working with the UC on another project. This is how we kind of got linked with Allied um, in a way, but to actually develop an artist in residency program for all the UC reserves, which are sort of these ecological research stations to showcase how we get artists helping solve these ecological issues. And so helped work with them on this. And the idea was how do we sort of draw all those amazing arts and sciences out to what we're calling like the front porch. <laughs> the, most of the campus is tucked away up in the woods and the, the ocean and the town are down here. And so how do we make a new front porch for the, for the school? And so the idea was really just to build a simple shed. Um, Allied does simple sheds nicer than other people, but <laughs> um, build a really simple shed that has sort of a front porch that um, can 
really just be a gathering place for a lot of people that people will come to no matter what, um, but also you know have a focused program there. And so what we did was we both designed it to be sort of a critical corridor um, and a crossing grounds for people. But another thing we looked at in how we sort of situated the building and why we decided to kind of run it really long was driven by a lot of habitat issues. I mean, we're at this kind of interesting interface between the meadow and the redwood grove and sort of this ecotone. Architects like to use that term. Every architect in the competition used that term, which is funny. <laughs> um, I guess it's in the buzzword now. But a lot of what happens from a habitat standpoint is uh, plants and animals, mostly mammals, like to move sort of along the forest edge and they like to have flexibility to kind of move and dash and hide. And we sort of drew an analogy to that also in how people like to move, you know? They like to be able to say, I can like kind of move along the edge and be out of sight or I can kind of walk out in the field and be more open and sort of instead of a bunch of smaller broken up buildings, having kind of one bigger piece allows people to stay and flow past it a lot. So here's kind of an example of that ecological condition. And um, we also worked on a bridge to get there, about an 800 uh, foot bridge, and we were able to come up with a concept where it only has two points of touchdown uh, within the creek, so sort of minimize impact. And, developed a system to be able to build it from without actually ever entering the creek. Some nice shots of the approach. And so as you come in, you're both kind of drawn out and see the connection, can flow through the space. Will built this model. <laughs> um, but a really beautiful structural system and lattice and almost like a skeleton for the building. Um, gallery spaces. And what we worked on is a lot of the systems and sort of obviously the siting and the ecology. But um, one thing and what sort of drove its really narrow form is obviously to get natural ventilation, be able to do in, in our design basically all the baseline heating and cooling and lighting is done naturally. So there's no, um, there's no need unless you have a specific sort of art or exhibit need for the, you know, more light or more temp, whatever it may be. So what we sort of dove into too is how do we start to make a biodynamic building and so obviously as I started to talk about from the site level we're looking at how bobcats and species migrate past this in addition to humans. Um, within the, the gallery space we actually also sort of started to think and I'll get into it a little more but how do we actually create a new art gallery for biological experimentation. Um, I like to bring it up because about a year ago we got asked to do a, an exhibit at the de Young Museum in San Francisco and apply for this, this residency and so we proposed developing these cool sort of, uh, we were calling them like bubble boy um, exhibits, but essentially there were these like vacuum sealed in, enclosed ecosystems within the museum and they came back and were like, we can't do this in the museum because of our HVAC codes and it'll impact the other artwork and so on and so forth. So we're going to say, how do we create a space to actually like allow biological exploration in, a, in an art space. And also, we wanted to, you know, especially with amazing dynamic roofs of this project, sort of honor and appreciate and revere and reuse that water. As you can see, there's these like kind of too simple but complex roof forms. And so we came up with a concept to basically capture all the water off those roofs and um, then sort of animate it, make it more dynamic piece and start to look at how we use the water as an art feature. And we also, on a more critical level, designed the building to not need any potable water. So basically, the net zero water. We can sustain the whole building from just the water that hits it. Um, and so for us, that's becoming more and more realistic on more and more projects. And it's really just permitting logistics that are hard. The cool thing with universities, they do their own permitting. So there's a much more capacity to do it here than anywhere else. Um, so as you can see here at the end of these roofs, there's going to be sort of a big uh, water feature that pours down and we want to both look at how we can play with that and sort of make art work out of it. Um, then we'll be collecting it under the building. Um, as you can see, there's sort of galleries and art spaces along the whole front. And oh, this, used to, this was put into Illustrator, but it's nice to have a little hand sketch. Um, so basically then the the water, rainwater all flows to about a 100,000 gallon tank 
gets used for all of our potable uses. That then flows to a waste uh, water treatment system, and that then gets used for all the non-potable uses. And basically, just with that roof structure, we can do everything we want. The other thing we wanted to look at is how do we sort of bring the ecology inside the building as well. We have this like kind of very precious ecosystem outside, and so we wanted to have a very light touch on that, but we wanted to sort of have this capacity for more experimentation inside. And so uh, what we looked at was sort of using this undulating rooftop that kind of dove into the courtyard to kind of create a, an ecological system that can actually help mediate humidity and provide humidity at times when it's actually quite dry here. And um, also, the big idea was that there's sort of a street through the building and the idea that those, these vines could kind of make that a nicer, softer feel. Um, another big piece that I was talking about, getting back to sort of the bio lab, is looking at how institutions build instruments. Um, this was, you know, in the 1930s, UCSC built Lick Observatory, and then it was like allowing them to do more meteorological science that was not possible because they kind of were able to build this bigger telescope. So that was sort of how we did it in, in the past, and a lot of what we're looking at is how do you sort of build new instruments for exploring art and science. Mm. What's really interesting is sort of what was science in the 30s has become sort of avant art in, <laughs> in our era now. And people are actually developing some really amazing um, scientific explorations through art discovery process. And we wanted to create a place in this, in this museum for that and more of it being a laboratory than actually a very precious museum, something what we what we referenced in our presentation was this idea that we needed like bionauts or people to really be exploring and investigating sort of how we engage with structures and how we engage with our ecosystems and how we adapt and manipulate those. So um, on the last section, how much more time do we have? No one's asked any questions. 10 minutes? Okay, cool. Great. Doing good, man. Um, so I was going to talk about metabolism a little bit. And in this concept, you know, what we like to get past is um, this idea of just thinking about ecology or just thinking about water, but looking at how sort of water and humans and energy are all interrelated. Um, and obviously, you guys are probably starting to see more and more of this, of how water is used to create energy, energy is used to create water. They're actually highly interlinked. And in California, we have basically 20% of our energy goes to these variety of pump stations. 5% goes to the one pump station in red. Um, and so what we're looking at is how do we take natural processes of like ourselves sweating, for example, which we use as a, a means to regulate temperature, and how do we get buildings to both respond to the humidity that we create in them, that you can see sort of building up on this screen, and also how we can get living systems to replicate our own processes for mitigating temperature. And so in this case, what you have is a, a rainforest next to um, a plant in our bathroom. We put a bag on to suffocate. Uh, but you can see the, the water evaporating. And what happens in this process is a huge amount of energy is released. And so um, if you look at studies, you can use about an eighth the amount of water to do the same cooling that you would use electricity for. And so when we got asked to do this project with Kieran Timberlake um, and Spurlock Poirier Landscape Architect in San Diego, they wanted to put a green roof on the building and they were like, well, it needs to be LEED certified, so we're gonna do the, a, a drought tolerant, non-irrigated roof. And I told them that was a horrific idea. <laughs> um, and so they were like, how? In San Diego, we can't use water to irrigate the roof. And I said, well, then you shouldn't put a green roof on the building because it really doesn't make any sense to put a green roof on a building um, and not irrigate it. Here's a cool study, especially in more arid climates, I should say. But here's a cool study where they had a white roof, a soil roof, a roof that was highly irrigated with vines, and then a roof that had a bunch of natives. And what you can start to see is like the numbers correlate down to the bottom, but the irrigated vine-covered roof stayed way cooler than anything else. It actually, the black dots are sort of the ambient temperature stayed cooler than the ambient temperature um, and stayed ex way cooler than the 
native drought tolerant roof. And so we said, if you're really thinking about a building holistically, we can't be in these silos where you have a landscape architect sitting there saying, I need to make my LEED certified building and use 80% whatever it is, drought tolerant plants and meet all these check marks. You have to really start to think and work between all the disciplines and kind of come up with a high performance building. And so we then carried those studies that were done by Arizona to a project we were working on just to verify that those same things would function in um, Northern California as well and not just in Arizona. So this was a cool opportunity where we had three roofs. One was white and had solar panels. One was irrigated uh, turf essentially and one was a native roof. And as you can see here, the native one was irrigated a little bit too. So the white roof fluctuates a ton over there. Um, the, the light green is the more irrigated turf roof that evapotrans buyers more and stays cooler. So even up into a temperature like way more mild like San Francisco, it's still definitely effective. Here's an image of the project in San Diego and with the green roofs on it post rendering. And um, one of the interesting things you'll see is this sort of rock scape below. And this came from an interesting study we looked into um, on campus where basically we're at the bottom of the campus. Even though we're in San Diego and there's no water, it floods like crazy and you get huge flash floods and all these uh, courts and parking lots and everything would flood down there. So we basically designed the site and the building to flood up and under the building um, and allow the flash floods just to kind of consume that space rather than utilize all this other real estate. We also, for the project, in order to justify putting the green roof on it, put a, a gray water system in. And one of the interesting things here was that we advocated for it highly on the project, but um, in sort of the typical building model, the university was like, well, we have this package treatment company that deals with all of our water treatment systems. They can just build it and put it in. And the real big problem is constantly with water reuse in buildings. We're expecting plumbing engineers to design these systems and they have no clue what they're doing. Um, as far as waste treatment, I should say. <laughs> um, and so it's really sort of realizing just because something's in the building doesn't mean the plumbing engineer needs to do it. In this case, you should really have a wastewater engineer, or environmental engineer, or septic engineer. What, what these guys do is use a really small tank, capture all the water, and then force it through tons of filters and try to clean it up right away and have then clean pure water in a really big tank. So that makes people feel better, but it doesn't really work. What you really want is the opposite. And what you end up having is here's the primary tank. It's quite small. The problem is you have no time for settling, for biological activity, for sort of microbes to break down a lot of the organic waste. What ends up happening is they're now cleaning this, the thing and replacing the carbon filter like 10 times a year. And um, so we're working with them now to re-engineer it. And so just to show another perfect case study of this, we did a project in um, Chicago in Cabrini Green. And we went in to, once again, solve a broken system. <laughs> so we, I actually read an article about this. And was, they were, had talked about how all of these green features don't work and how PV, or sorry, the wind turbines, one of them blew off the roof. And they turned the gray water system off. And the big take home message is no one's actually taught. The people who operate these buildings are not taught how to use the systems. And, once again, they're just not designed well. Same exact problem on this one. No biological treatment. Whoops. Um, we had to go in. There was no map of the system. We had to map it out. And the, the worst part was that they basically had no, once again, no biological filtration. So these sort of fine micro filters are doing all that work, getting clogged all the time, and look horrific like this, which is all good stuff. It's like microbes and biology growing on it. It's just you don't want it to happen here. You want it way further down before then. So <laughs> just going to talk about one, basically one last project, I think. Um, and once again, I'm open for questions whenever. But in this project, uh, we're working with Snowetta, an architect that you guys probably know, on new SF MoMA. And it's kind of a crazy project because they have to pack so much program in. There's, so it kind of looks like a giant iceberg in my mind. Um, <laughs> but I think it's kind of interesting. And so the problem with this, the fact that they have so much art, is that we get one little sliver of landscape on the wall <laughs> of the site. Um, and so we got asked to help them design that. But the cool thing is 
even though it is on the wall, it kind of becomes a backdrop from tons of the different galleries. Um, and it's kind of a very cool feature in this sort of living crevice. Um, and so what we started doing was when we got on the project, they were actually freaking out that the project would use way too much water and they needed to meet their lead credits and there were, the wall would use all this water, which is true. Living walls use way too much water. I sometimes call them drugs on rugs. I mean, yeah, rugs on drugs, sorry. <laughs> rugs on drugs, um, especially the felt-based ones. And basically, as you can see, we compared another one, which is like the purple and gray bars, another um, sort of felt-based living wall that was built in uh, San Francisco, and it just uses so much water. Um, it definitely dropped after they kind of optimized it, but the blue and the yellow and the red are all kind of like calculator standards of what we're allowed to use in California, maximum allowable water, and those levels are way above. And our first calculations for our project were that we would be <laughs> way above too because the water just runs off the wall. About 80% of the water that you put on runs off. So it's very hard to be efficient with it. And so we then proposed a recirculating system, which gets a lot harder because you start to design essentially this like life support system for the wall. Um, that said, we also came to them and said, you don't really have a problem. You have tons of available water on this project. There's tons of places that we can get water. And um, we've got water coming from the cooling towers. We've got all this water coming from people sweating in the building. So it comes in the form of condensate. At times, it's like 20, not, sorry, 2,000 gallons a day, just water that's been captured from the building. So in that process, we said, how do we start to take, um, in the case of cooling tower blowdown, sort of a very similar process to also a sweating. It seems like there's a lot of sweat-related analogies here. But um, <laughs> essentially, in addition to sweating, what we use that to do is excrete, excrete salts. And I think salts for an ecologist are like the biggest fear. Well, other people have like a poo taboo. I have a salt taboo because they're like the, it's the most devastating to ecology. Um, and it's the hardest thing for us to process and deal with. And, um, and I think that's our biggest limiting factor in water supply, not like E. coli or bacteria or all those good things. So um, that said, what we wanted to do was look at how we could design a living wall to deal with the cooling tower blowdown, which has highly concentrated evaporated water that has a lot more salts in it. It's more laden with sodium and chloride. So those things become really hard for the plants to deal with. One amazing thing is everyone's afraid of these biocides that they put in cooling towers. We actually, to actually keep biology from growing, <laughs> we were amazed. We did some studies on it and they actually have really fast half-life. Uh, the, most of the biocides dissipate and volatize in 24, 48 hours. So the things that you think you should be worried about are not necessarily as as problematic as some of the things other people don't think about. And so what we did was we actually put a research study together and set up these plots behind the dumpster behind the current MoMA. So <laughs> it's funny, this is actually how reporters first found out that they might be doing a living wall on the MoMA because someone walked by the back and they're like, why is there a little living wall behind the dumpster at the MoMA? <laughs> so <laughs> we, uh, but the reason we put it there was to sort of mimic all the conditions that are happening there. and we worked with the lighting engineer air up to sort of do studies of how much light's gonna hit different parts of the wall to both sort of design the test as well as to look at how we design the whole wall. Um, and so in the studies, what we did is we developed different shading conditions over the two, over the two walls. One of the walls is irrigated with cooling tower blowdown. One of them was just potable water. Um, the other thing we realized is we have such low light, we wanted to try a variety of mushrooms on these walls. And um, the really amazing thing is the oysters looked great for like a few days and then they drooled down the wall. And so we're like, maybe that's not a great solution. Uh, <laughs> but on the other hand, there's these perennial mushrooms that will grow for like three to five, seven years and, and kind of can sustain way better and a better option for wells. So we're continuing that testing. Um, so you can start to see some of these studies. And it, if you see here, the ones on the left actually have more shading than the ones on the right in each condition. Um, so what we started to do is kind of look at this over time. And what we found out is when the plants were both deprived of light <laughs> and were given this non-potable saltier water, especially a lot of shade-loving plants essentially kind of started to, to 
fry out a little bit. You can see it on the side of the, this, sort of the far side of the closer one to me. Um, the plants start to fry out and aren't developing as well as a lot of places. But we also found if we could flush them, w the salts weren't building up that much. And it was mostly, in this case, more because shade tolerant plants are normally freshwater forest ecosystems. And if we were designing a really bright living wall, we could get plants to sustain these conditions. And especially in San Francisco, the, the pH and those levels weren't much worse. So we found really good studies. But then it was exciting because we finally were able to like grapple out of the mechanical engineer's hands um, the, the condensate water, which is way nicer. It's like evaporated water from the building. And so we were able to find enough condensate. This is a map of the blowdown and the condensate, as well as the rainwater over the course of the year. And we were able to match, whoops, here we go, match our demand for the wall. The irrigation is in blue. Um, using only condensate in the summer and then a little bit of rainwater in the winter to make it up. And so here's a map of sort of all of those. We have like toilet, which is blue, and our green, which is our irrigation demands, set aside sort of the two waters which we're using, which are storm water and cooling tower condensate. And here, what you can see is that the blue is actually the toilets. And I was like, why does the toilet demand change so much over the year? But the main thing is the museum has so many more visitors during the summer. So that demand kind of peaks. And so we're nowhere near meeting all of the building's demand. If we were able to convince the plumbing uh, engineer to use blowdown for toilets, we could have met it. But he's conservative. So we had to kind of stay within our scope, unfortunately. <laughs> but we're meeting all of our demand um, without any potable water. And so the other cool thing that I just want to show you very briefly is that you know you need to get in and do all the drawings and the details to make it actually work. Um, so we do all the plumbing drawings and we also do, and I think this is kind of an interesting arena, is all the sort of automation logic for how we're going to keep this life support system going. So this down here is sort of fertigation systems, wind valves and flow meters and everything open and closed. Um, and so I'll show you another project sort of this is the MoMA and fast forward that we just built with sort of very similar system, but this is just a commercial building in San Francisco. We built this with our really good friends, Habitat Horticulture. They build and collaborate with us on the design and then maintain these walls. And that's the key. If you ever want to build a living wall, make sure people are going to pay for maintenance because it's, <laughs> it's a high maintenance object. And so here's uh, the wall going on. Um, they're actually stapling the plants into the wall. All the plants go up in about a week or two, so the plumbing and everything took a lot longer. Here's a shot from outside, kind of inside. Mm. Some of the artwork. This is actually a public lobby. You're welcome to go hang out there. This guy was grilling me, though, <laughs> one of the security guards. So you're not that welcome, I guess, to go there. Um, <laughs> but you're legally allowed. Um, so that's all the kind of front of house. And then I wanted to show a little bit of the back of house, which is kind of the brains of what makes something like this operate. And there's tons of different irrigation zones. Uh, five of them, we have flow meters on everything. We're really into sort of metering and understanding as much of the data as possible, sort of a pump system. Um, this is actually, as it's getting built, a nutrient dosing system. So every time the water comes off the wall, um, we capture it and reuse that water probably about four times before it evaporates or we have to get rid of it because it's just too salty. And so we, Every time we get it back, we sort of balance the pH with acid or base, and then we add more nutrients and send it back up to the wall um, with this control system that we, that that drawing you saw previously, this is it translated into phys physical life. Um, so I actually have one project more, I forget, forgot, sorry. <laughs> if we have time? Okay, so quickly I'll show you a project we're doing, public toilets in San Francisco. We actually, I was working on a living wall project, which motivated this and someone basically we were building it over the course of three days my car got pooped on twice and peed on at least once that I could that I could see and so we just have an amazing <laughs> waste epidemic in downtown San Francisco so we did a map we had to call um, public works and sort of call all this data out of them of how many times they go out to clean human waste so this is a little heat map of waste we came up with a concept of sort of what our typical current toilet model is, and then a way that we could have a way more like architecturally as well as sort of ecologically transparent system. 
and the community driven and funded model. So over the course of about a year, we've been working with the city and community benefit districts and a um, variety of different homeless support groups, about 30 of them, to develop what our client, the community benefit district, will not like me to publicly call the pooplet, which is our, our term for it. Um, <laughs> and um, I assume this is family and friends. This isn't public. So um, the... <laughs> But I did actually spill the beans in the New York Times, and so hopefully they'll start to, uh, you know, warm up to it. Um, but the pooplet is essentially our like parklet um, strategy that's actually provides a utility. I mean, parklets are an awesome social activator for cities, but I found them to be sort of a very socioeconomic elitist um, solution in most cities, where you know they're mostly built in a place where people have enough money to build them and they're normally serving some commercial use. It's like, you can sit here no matter what, but you better buy a coffee from us. Um, and so we've been sort of looking at how do we start to design parklets more for actual utility in the city or for social services. And so came up with this strategy. We got funding for it and are building it this summer. And it has an indoor toilet up this ramp series of uh, sort of wetland planters, urinal. We're doing an amazing project with this group in Marin to compost the waste off-site and deal with the urine and water on-site. Here's some drawings of it. Um, kind of be trellises in the back and plants growing up the trellis. And so like everything else, we wanted to build a prototype. So we built the pea planter, um, which was sort of the first step to the full toilet, and it's just a urinal. So we did this whole project in about three or four weeks from kind of these first drawings to molding the sinks and urinals digitally and then physically and then sort of vacuum forming those and then you know cutting those out and building the whole system and just dropping it on the street in San Francisco. So we've been like working for two years with the city and public works and health department and dealing with tons and tons of red tape and so we said, well, we just need to do a trial because everyone's so scared of this thing. They're worried, like, we're going to put this urinal out and it's just going to, like, leak all over the place. And so we were like, if we just get one on the street and show that it can work, they'll just sort of re hopefully relieve a lot of their stress. So we built it before this, this whole upfest um, that was happening in San Francisco. And in the cool idea is basically all the water gets pumped out with a foot and pump, goes through the sink, that flushes the urinal goes into a tank and gets pumped out, also with a foot pump, so all passive, to as many planters as you need for your event. And so here's Julia d demonstrating it, one of, one of the designers. We have funnels for women uh, to use the urinal, disposable funnels, and here's the foot pump after she uses it, washes her hands, it flushes the urinal she just used, and kind of flows into this little terrarium. And in there, it's cool, we actually have sort of a wireless control system and an occupancy sensor. So we knew that about like 450 people used it the first night it was out. Um, and here's people using it, coming in and out. Um, even the next morning we left it out for a while and uh, we had people using it all day. <laughs> and we left it I think for three or four days. So that like really made the city happy. So then we built another one that was actually ADA compliant because that one, the first one wasn't. It was a lot prettier, but this one sort of met all their requirements and everything. So we built another one. Someone tagged it really nicely. Um, <laughs> but one of the things we did was actually try a whole bunch of different plastic materials. And this side's actually high density polyethylene, which you can just acid wash that off. So. I like it, but you know that's one of the issues the city wants is like highly cleanable. Um, the other thing we did is Jeremy, who works with us, who's kind of maintaining a bunch of it. But next to him is Wayne. He's a formerly homeless um, man in the city that actually was the primary operator for the whole thing. Come out every two or three hours. He kept like amazingly extensive notes where <laughs> of everything that happened there, um, <laughs> including I think the first one of the first people to use it on the first night. Also one of the first people to to try to use crack in there, but actually he said that he didn't feel comfortable using it. So that was sort of an awesome um, design uh, win for us. But that was, <laughs> that is like a real critical issue we're fo facing. And the other bathrooms in the area are these big black boxes that are basically used as hotel rooms now. And 
we wanted it to be extremely transparent and so, sort of awkward, you know, and not totally comfortable. So that's been sort of one of our big mantras, but it's been amazing to have him out there and people actually operating, maintaining it from the community, because I think that really drives a lot of the, the elements. And finally, I'm about to end, and I'm just giving a little teaser once again for tomorrow, because this is a teaser about our nonprofit, Adapt Oakland. Um, basically, our office and community is based here. We have some of the worst air pollution in um, California, about five or six times worse than anywhere else. And it's just a very um, exciting project that we're working on to build green belts along the freeway. So uh, I don't have time to talk about it, I don't think, but come check out our other project. So I'm just going to run through photos of our community. People basically have to clean um, their window screens every few weeks from particulate matter. Um, we don't have really anywhere to exercise that's not uh, right up against a freeway or to actually bike to work that's not right against a freeway. A lot of the new developments are getting built right along railroads. Um, we're working with this community activist, Margaret Gordon, on strategies to actually clean it up. So the project's called Urban Biofilter, and the idea is to sort of take all the externalities and the costs from um, the impacts we have on our community and sort of revitalize and put that into green infrastructure and fund green infrastructure to alleviate all those externalities. So some photos of it. <laughs> That's it. All right. <laughs> if you want to hear more from tomorrow. sort of getting the condensate off of your refrigeration systems and the cooling systems. So it's sort of just by condensing on in that process, you, you're able to get, I think on the MoMA, about 70% of our water comes from the actual HVAC system. Um, and about 20 to 30 comes from dehumidification. And so the amazing thing is it's, you know, evaporated water. It's like rainwater in the sense that it's, you know, all the salts are still on someone's face somewhere, and <laughs> we just have the water. And so that's um, a really nice element. And it's on a ton of projects, like becoming, especially in um, throughout California, like a primary water source now. And I almost feel bad using it on the wall because it should be used in a better use. But especially in this project, it's like the wall is such a high profile piece. and. Like, it's a very shady condition, and so having sort of really fresh water is important. But in most cases, I mean, we should be drinking that or doing something better with it, like flushing toilets or <laughs> at least. Yeah, well, they're, they're doing a conversion down in, in Peru and in, in other places. So, so I was really aware of that, so it's very cool. Yeah. There's someone behind you. Project is really interesting. Um, they're proposing to add all this green infrastructure, and I was wondering how you're planning on combating issues that have been happening in West Oakland for a while um, in terms of crime and um, transparency, and making sure that these spaces are able to stay green and don't turn yeah. into. Do you work for Homeland Security? <laughs> <laughs> These are all the same questions they ask me. So. Um, <laughs> basically, one of our big our big drivers is that um, for sort of that for that component is that a you know it's a 
broader epidemic issue and hopefully by like creating more jobs we can solve it, but that's sort of a, avoiding the question, you know? Um, I think the other element is that a lot of the management of transient communities in these areas, even like way closer to the downtown, like where our office is, there's tons of people that live right by the freeway, <clears throat> even where there isn't much vegetation. And I think a lot of it actually comes down to a policing issue where those areas are actually either in the port, the, the managed by Homeland Security, or in other areas managed by Caltrans who are, are, and sort of the highway patrol and they're notoriously lazy, and the city police don't actually have authority to go in there. And so part of what we're saying is like, there's a loophole right now in how it's managed, and by actually having people out there managing and working on it, we can also take that on. And so one of the things we're proposing is to basically develop lease agreements with Caltrans, with the city, take over management of the land, which includes management of the blight. So, I mean, for us, it's just owning that responsibility. You talked a lot about this collaborative process and the fact that you're making inroads. So, for example, convincing San Bernardino to think about water a little bit differently or working with architects mm -hmm. and having a deliverable associated with the contract. And I'm just curious, what's the, what's the model process for you? Is there a project that went more swimmingly and it led to a more profound outcome? Or if, yeah. if you could imagine a process, a dream process for you, what would it look like? Yeah, we, I mean, we're grappling with that constantly, and we just, we, I mean, we had a really fun design process with Allied, who's really open to that, and sort of took a lot of our constraint models and ideas to drive their forms, but one good example just that I'm dealing with right now is we're on two projects with the same contractor in San Francisco. One of them is going to build the MoMA, and one of them just built that other living wall, and so they're, it's a really awesome case study because it's the same contracting firm, almost the same type of system and they're going totally differently. And part of that I think is because the smaller one that just got built is a, a far younger, more innovative project manager from the contractor side. The one managing the MoMA is like very old school where like we come in like military file and like all the design team sits on one side of the table and the contractors sit on the other side. And like I just was on a call today dealing with the MoMA where in addition to the wall we designed some green roofs. And like they still haven't provided us, the contractor hasn't provided us the value engineering um, items or essentially the budgets even for our, our components. They've given us a lump sum but not a broken out budget. And I'm like, I can work with the contractor to make sure that they sort of are bidding everything right, find ways to make it more affordable. And it's this very sort of like tight lip sealed thing. And instead of like a dialogue, I get random emails like them saying we, they email 14 people and say, we're gonna remove the irrigation system from the living roof to save cost. And I'm like, I can pay, in my response, I was like, this is just today. I was like, we could pay for the irrigation controller in the amount of money that you're spending to send this email out to 14 consultants who are all charging 100, 150 bucks an hour. Like in 20 minutes of all of us reading these emails, we would have paid for the irrigation controller. So it's like part of that dialogue, right? And, and that said, the amazing thing that happened on the other project is it was way more fast paced. We came in to sort of more, while it was being constructed and it was, ended up being more of a design build. It wasn't like a formal integrated project delivery system, but we also, the one thing we did was we said, okay, we started talking to the, the mechanical contractor because they were already on the project and they said, well, we're gonna have to, you know, like after you build us a 3D model, you're go we're gonna have to rebuild that model legally. And we said, that just doesn't make any sense. It's like, why don't we provide you drawings? And then we sit down and we build the model together and you own it and you build it and you send us back ideas and we vet it. And so what ended up happening is you didn't have a process between the designer and the contractor that was like vindictive. You know, we both worked on the design together and then as it's getting built, we're basically there both covering each other's ass. You know, at times I go to him and, you know, he needs more time because he underbid it because he never built something like this. And I go and get him some more time from the owner. But then there are two or three things we screwed up on and forgot to put valves places. And instead of it being a big legal issue, they just like rolled in and did it and fixed it because we had a good relationship and rapport. And so 
what we're trying to do is to reduce some of the construction drawing work that we do, still own it and be liable for it, but a lot of that wasted time that the contractor is also doing, we basically do together, and so then we end up stamping it. They build the model and we stamp it, but there's more of a collaboration, and I think that's a huge thing, and the contractor on that project, anytime there's an issue, they just get everyone in the room and say, like, let's figure it out right now, rather than just waiting a few months and then getting a random email that something's been removed. You know, and I think that's really critical. <clears throat> and then within the design team, you know, an interesting thing on the MoMA is we kind of came on later than a lot of the consultants. And I think as we work with a lot of other plumbing and engineering uh, contractors, they start to like gain respect and feel less threatened because for like two years they'd all been on the project and not really sort of pulled all the water issues together in one place like we had. And basically, you know, the civil engineer's like, I've got all this water that the city's making me do something with each day. And he couldn't break through to the plumbing engineer. Um, and there were all these disconnects. But by having one person kind of map it all out, it's easier for everyone to understand. So I think, you know, just working more with people, there's more ability to collaborate. Hey, Brent. Awesome work. It's really great to see uh, these kind of projects uh, going on out there. And uh, I, love, I love that you're working so hard. <laughs> For sure. Uh, some of us, I think, dreamed uh, of the day when, as designers, we would actually have uh, an ecologists on our team. <laughs> you know? And uh, it's awesome to, to see that uh, type of thing because it also makes it easier for us to convince our potential clients. Yeah. You know, people like you working. Uh, doing what you're doing, we can convince our potential clients that hey, it's a good idea, it looks cool, you know, these, we get, here's a professional that does it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to, just a couple of things I want to ask, uh, two questions. Uh, one, just, if you could talk a little bit about what's the composition of your team? I mean, is it only ecologists? Do you get the landscape architects? Are you looking towards getting, uh, you know, building designers and others within what you do? Because I know, I mean, I've, we've talked before and, you know, you, you really <clears throat> get involved in the design process quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and the, other, the other question, uh, is as far as rain, har rain water harvesting and such, I mean, in the Bay Area and the fog, and, and you know, do you collect fog? And what about a, a fog net that would drop the water onto a roof uh, uh, on a trellis or something like that? And uh, what about the particulates and cleaning that? Do you chlorinate? Do you aerate? That kind of thing. I'll do the first one, um, which we have seven people right now, and we're a combination of civil engineer. Landscape architect, architect, landscape architect, environmental engineer, building scientist. So kind of a mixture. Um, but <clears throat> in most cases, looking for people in any of those disciplines that are sort of more generalists and systems thinkers. Um, so I'm not like uh, partial to necessarily what discipline they come from, but sort of a process and a philosophy. But ultimately, we want to just keep growing in that model and sort of blurring the lines and having all the different disciplines we're actually trying to hire more of like a mechanical systems engineer so we can really understand the, the air and the humidity and HVAC components more. We're also trying to hire another like you know, landscape or civil. So um, second question, the rainwater systems. Um, actually, we, we did a bunch of concepts for that Santa Cruz project that included uh, fog harvesting and on a really basic level, we found on a lot of the roofs we designed, you get condensation from fog every day if you've got a metal roof system. So basically, as that is warmer underneath, it sort of captures and holds like a glass would. You know, it captures the, the condensate from the air, and then as it warms up outside, runs off the roof. <clears throat> so on a lot of roofs, we're getting like through the summer a good bit of water just on the roof. And fog nets are an interesting strategy. We proposed some for this project. One of the things just from, depending on your climate, where we are, you, know, you need a lot of square footage to get a small amount of water. And so if you can make it like a really cool architectural element, I think it's a good solution. And we're definitely investigating it. Um, and as far as particulate matter, we are looking at strategies to actually like mist and spray the air to drop the particulates out, um, in addition to sort of just capturing them in, in plants. So I'm not sure if that's what the question was. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about the reading train system of the SF Moore and uh, it looked like it was pretty automated. Um, and you mentioned building managers. Um, 
um, and to know how you're developing systems and ways to educate them, um, especially with turnover with the physicians, yeah. um, because of uh, they that are complicated systems that need to be um, well known and how you're uh, combating that. Yeah, no, it's, it's a huge issue. Um, in this case, we do most of these with Habitat Horticulture, a company that maintains them, and they're like extremely anal about it, which is great. Um, and so you can't get that everywhere. We have like an amazing resource in San Francisco. Um, but that said, one, th one of the things we did to try to tackle that issue is like, instead of bringing in completely different types of automation, we're using standard building control systems. And so there is a, lot, a little more upfront cost to sort of manipulate that to doing irrigation type control. But afterwards, it's like the same guy who can maintain the HVAC system can come and maintain the controls for that whole system. And obviously the operator who's doing the wall maintenance has to have more sort of chemistry and biology and horticulture experience, but the person building the system is mostly off the shelf building management systems. And we've been trying to get um, building management systems a lot cheaper. That's one of the biggest problems, like whether it's this wall or any other HVAC system, it's still really expensive. And there's great low cost sensing equipment. It's just like this, the electrical manufacturers have like a lock on this market. And so in a few years, we'll have really low cost of ubiquitous sensing. And so we're still in kind of a kludgy area, I would say, from a technology development standpoint. We just had these irrigation controller like manufacturers in our office the other day. And I'm like, you guys are years behind. You got to catch up because we have to go build these custom things because there's nothing off the shelf that I can use to do it. So I think it's, you know, just an evolution in the technology. Okay, thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. <laughs> um, <but> <laughs>